record. Okay, hi everybody. Um, this is Karen Dagler. I work for the Center for, for Purposeful Work at Bates. And we're doing a program today on nursing and physician assistant studies. And I'm so grateful to um, our two alums that are here, Sarah Bouchard and Alyssa Connors. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves. And then I've got a series of questions that um, I'm going to ask them and have them answer. So, um, okay, take it away, either Sarah or Alyssa, whichever one of you guys want to go first. I'll go first. Um, hi, everyone. As Karen said, my name is Sarah. I was Bates class of 2015. Um, I um, was a neuroscience major and I had concentrations in English and philosophy. Um, after graduating from Bates, I moved to Boston and worked for a year as a clinical research coordinator at Boston Medical Center. Um, I was working on a study called the Long Life Family Study. It was looking at the genetics of longevity, um, a lot of hands-on sort of like um, assessing patients on the study protocol, drawing blood, doing ultrasounds on them, neurocog testing. Um, so I did that for a year. And then when I decided I wanted to go to PA school, I wanted to get like a little bit more of pathology and seeing patients who weren't like extremely healthy living till 100. Um, so I worked in a private practice dermatology clinic in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and I was seeing like, I was helping on surgeries and doing um, lasers and some minor procedures with the doctors and just doing a lot of general dermatology and that was for about three years. Um, so a year ago, I started my first year, my didactic year of PA school at Duke down in North Carolina. Um, and so I'm just finishing up my didactic year now, the next couple of months, and then I'll start my clinical rotations in the summer, hopefully, so. That's great. Okay, Alyssa. Hi, everybody. Um, I am, uh, I graduated in 2016. I was a psychology major um, with uh, like neuroscience thesis with Nancy Coven, um, philosophy, and I forgot my other concentration. Um, after Bates, I also moved to Boston um, and I worked at a community health center. I was a case manager there um, for about two years and I did, uh, I connected patients to resources like food, housing, um, shelter, like any pretty much all the things that can, it's all the social determinants of health things that um, can impact your health. And I also volunteered at an immigration nonprofit and nannied for a bit. Um, then I applied to schools and now I'm finishing up my first year at UCSF. And we're clinical from the, from the beginning. So um, the first year is an accelerated RN. And then I'll be going in September into my specialty year, the first of two which is midwifery. So I'll be a um, certified nurse midwife and women's health nurse practitioner at the end of those two years. Great, thank you guys. Um, that was great, perfect. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose um, each of your programs, um, specifically physician assistant versus nurse practitioner? Um, you know, how did you waver between them or did you think about uh, entering medical school, or how did you come to the decision you did you did to apply to the schools you did, uh, or apply to the programs you did? Um, you want to start, Alyssa, first this time. Sure. Um, so I was pre med at Bates, and I did almost all the prereqs, pretty much everything except for calc, um, and I knew pretty much like sophomore year that. I was really interested in the nurse practitioner track and I was interested in doing something different, but I had a really hard time making the decision. So I continued to take all the pre-med requirements. Um, it wasn't until after Bates when I was doing the work at the community health center that I actually made the decision um, to switch to nurse practitioner. Um, I was really, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I, so I did a lot of shadowing and I think that's really what helped me make the decision.
because I felt like I fit in with the nurse practitioners I met more. Um, it felt less competitive. And that's, I think, a big thing that I've seen in the NP field is that it's really collaborative and um, people are, are all trying to help each other, both clinically and in school. So, and I, I think that the other thing I liked, the other reason that I went for it was because when I did work at the community health center, which is where I envisioned myself working one day, it was staffed entirely by nurse practitioners and one, so there was one OBGYN who was um, on call and would come in once a week, but the 20 staff that were there every day were all nurse practitioners and nurse midwives. And that was the, and then in other, in other um, departments, there might be more of a, a mix, but the majority of the staff at the health center were nurse practitioners. So I, I saw myself um, there and that was part of the reason that I, that I chose it. Great, thank you. What about you, Sarah? Um, I was also pre-med at Beats and all the way through like my first year after I graduated, um, when I was working in research, I was still trying to decide, am I gonna take the MCAT? Am I gonna take the GRE? Um, I signed up for the MCAT in a prep course and I don't know, I'm a very like self-motivated person and it was like a very weird feeling that I had. I just didn't want to like study for the MCAT and I didn't know why. And um, I just decided to like pump the brakes a little bit and try to figure out like if it's, if it was what I wanted. And like Alexa said, I did a lot of shadowing. I just kind of asked around like different coworkers who were applying and they said that they shadowed this PA or this doctor and just kind of ever, as you'll see, like as you reach out to people, everyone in like the medical field is really willing to talk with um, prospective students and allow you to spend a day with them. That was really helpful for me. Um, when I worked in research and in dermatology, I didn't work with any mid-level providers. And that was hard for me because it was always in the back of my head, but I had never really seen one practicing. Um, I don't even think I saw one like from my own healthcare. So I went and shadowed a few PAs and I was just like, it was crazy how much autonomy they had and how um, like just uh, competent they were with patients. And you can tell um, how like PAs in particular are trained, kind of like really focus in on patient history and like holistic um, patient care. And that's what I really liked. I also really like the team-based model that the um, PA like education is based around. So we learn about dentistry and um, about like, we learn about midwives and we, we just, we in PTs, we learn about incorporating all types of medicine like into the care of the patient. And I think just kind of learning about the different parts of the healthcare team and seeing like where you might see yourself, I knew that I wouldn't be super confident with making like the final decisions on um, patient's care, like having everything lie on me. I'm kind of like a nervous person. And so even though PAs do have a lot of autonomy, I really like that I can like rely on an attending um, physician to kind of guide me and like, it's you never stop learning. And that's what I really liked about PA. Great, that's great, perfect. Um, thank you. Um, both of you guys, you know, I know that both programs are about 24 to 27 months. Um, could you, do you guys, I'm not, we, didn't, we haven't talked about this, but I'm wondering if you could talk about the difference that I always hear about the nursing model um, and the physician model or the medical model. Could you talk about the difference of how the, that each of the graduate programs are, you know, sort of approached from the different models? Maybe either one of you could pipe in. I could talk about um, the nursing model. That was a big reason why I did chose, choose the nurse practitioner route. Um, I liked that the nursing model um, looks really holistically at patients. Um, so it's not, it's holistic and I would say like holistic and collaborative. Um, so it looks a lot at like people's like barriers to health. Um, and you also have more time with patients. So I think that, so the nurse practitioner came out of nursing originally, um, where you learn more clinically and rather than doing the um, like hard sciences, 
you're learning clinically from the beginning. Um, and the idea with the nurse practitioner is that you're adding on um, this, like the, the more autonomy piece to the practitioner part after be, being a nurse. So you have your clinical experience to, to go off of. Um, so for example, in my friend who's in, she's just finishing her medical school um, and starting residency as an OBGYN, so same thing. So she doesn't have class on like how to do clinical, like how to, um, like what are the right medications or what are the right, what's the right, like the best evidence-based protocol. You do the sciences and then you go to the hospital and you learn in the hospital from who's in the hospital. Um, whereas in nursing school and the nurse practitioner world, you learn in the classroom how to do things clinically. So I really like that because they'll tell us all the time, this is the evidence-based way to do it. This is what the research says. This is what you're gonna see in the hospital. Don't do that, do this. Or you're gonna see this in the hospital and research isn't backing it up, but we also agree with, that's like the way that we should do things. But it's not just, it's not blindly follow their advice, but it's just constantly looking at the research throughout school. Um, so I really like that that it's the, just this emphasis on clinical learning, both in the classroom and in the, yeah, in the hospital. Great, what about you, Sarah? Um, so the PA model is really based highly around the medical school model. It's like they created the PA um, profession basically for veterans coming back from war who had all this amazing medical experience as medics. And they were, they all had families, they were in their like their 20s, 30s, didn't really necessarily have time to go back to medical school, but they were ready to help serve like the medical needs in our country. And so they basically made this accelerated, Duke started the PA profession, which I thought was cool. Um, but they had this accelerated model where they basically take med school one, med school year four, and like smush it into two years of like, just <laughs> literally no breaks, accelerated, you learn, everything you need to know about didactic like medicine in one year um, and instead of going into the deep like pathophysiology that the med students do you kind of just learn what you need to know to care for patients rather than like oh that's why this medication works that's why this disease looks like this you just kind of learn how to diagnose how to treat and all of that kind of understanding will come in your clinical years when you practice as a PA so it's just a really great way to get like pr providers out into the field right away um, and it definitely is the medical definitely the medical model um, disease state diagnosis and treatment um, and so that was like comforting to me I think just in terms of like I, I was comfortable with medical school the option of med medical school and it was just like okay well I can basically do that in two years um, and so I think like the fact that PAs really do work really closely with doctors makes the most sense with that that you would want them learning on the same model um, for that. Great, that's awesome. Great, thank you guys. Um, prerequisites, so you know, most of the classes I know um, for our student listeners, um, they know that we offer anatomy and physiology, but we did not offer that when Alyssa and Sarah went to Bates, so we're very fortunate to have that now. Um, but did you guys do any of your prereqs after you graduated? And why don't we start with Sarah and Salissa? Yes, so I had A and P1 and 2 and microbiology still up to take. Um, and I looked all around the Boston area. It was really tough with my job because I worked 10 hour days. And so all of the classes, like there's so many schools in Boston where you can take prereqs, but a lot of them started at five o'clock and I usually didn't get out of work till seven. Um, and so I actually ended up like calling around to a few schools I was applying to and asking them about community college and what if they would take community college classes and all of them said 100% we'll take them. Um, they're cheaper than a lot of like prereqs that you can take in Boston like BU or Harvard Extension. Um, I will say it's not as rigorous as Bates was. It's not as rigorous as probably BU and Harvard Extension were. It was a really good option for me because I was able to make every class there on weekends. Um, they were very flexible. Everyone there was working, being a student full-time, had kids. It was 
just a great way to like supplement my school or my work experience with with classes that I needed. Um, and then when I got to PA school, you literally have to redo micro and anatomy anyway. And so I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. Like they expected us to still have to relearn when we got there based on like medicine. So um, I was really happy with that. I was able to save money and take them like with what worked with my schedule. Um, that did take me the AMP1, AMP2 and micro did take me, it kind of set me back like a year, took a good two, like, two years basically to finish those or a year and a half. Um, so I would definitely recommend like looking into options if you need prereqs and getting that kind of done first. That, that's a really good first step because not having those classes can delay your application almost like a whole cycle possibly. Um, what about you, Alyssa? Yeah, I'm so glad to hear you have anatomy and physiology. Um, I And micro. Oh, you have micro too. Yeah, we just started. Um, we just uh, we hired a new professor last fall. Her name is Lori Banks, and she's teaching microbiology. So we're oh. we're in better shape now. <laughs> so then, for um, NP schools, for the most part, I, th I guess the only thing you'd be missing is nutrition. Um, is that right? Yep. And um, just to add to that, the per same person who is, pr his professor's name is Bruno uh, Cereza Perea. He's teaching, um, he can teach nutrition too. So that's been offered as well. So the yeah. current students are um, pretty lucky. Wow. Yeah, I think um, that was, that was really, I think part of the, what was difficult for me about even making the decision to do NP was feeling like, it's not encouraged. Like I'm going to Bates, I'm supposed to be a doctor. Like they don't even offer the classes that I need to become a nurse practitioner. Um, and I know that wasn't, that wasn't actually the stance of the school, but it's kind of what I read into it. Um, and, ha and part of the reason that I was like, okay, I'm going to have to go to community college to take these prereqs. Like, why is this make more sense for me? But going, if you do have the opportunity to take one of these classes at at a community college like statistics you have to take within three years so i had to retake stats um at i took it at bunker hill community college and i took a and p and nutrition and micro and i thought that um it was a really valuable experience to go to a community college and just have an experience that was so different than bates um, to meet a ton of different people to, I don't, it was just, um, I felt like I learned a lot just from that, having that experience and it was really lucky for me. Um, and like just navigating there, like how to sign up for classes is so complicated at Bates. It's like the go in the Garnet gateway and you, uh, the dates are really obvious and like community college is like, they hand you a credit card and they're like, you know, this is like you can sign up for classes on this and you're like should I use this and it's like no don't use that you know so there was just this whole other like really um kind of I don't know really like for-profit system in your face that was really interesting to see but also people who really cared about students working there um anyway sorry so the GRE is not required anymore for most of the schools I had to take it um, I was like the last year that most schools were asking for the GRE. I think it's still possible that some are, but for the most part, a lot of them are getting rid of it. Um, what else? Prerequisites. And then they really um, recommend having some sort of uh, direct patient care experience. So it doesn't have to be like clinical. You know, my experience was working as a case manager, um, but like out of our class of 80, we have one, two, we have two students who took one year between, but nobody who came like straight through. Um, and that's, I had what my, my friend is one of the students that took a year off and she would, wanted to go straight through and they told her when she talked to admissions, like we really recommend you take a year. And she ended up um, scribing for a year in the emergency room. Um, and it, it just made her, it was easier for her to like write her essays afterwards and to speak on how the clinical experience that she's had or seen like informs why she wants to do what she's doing. So I think that makes you a stronger applicant too. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Sarah, can you touch on that a little bit too with TA, um, what your class is like, how many uh, students came directly from undergrad or didn't, and maybe um, I think that I know I read a lot of grad school and professional school essays, and I know it does seem to me, this is anecdotal, that people that have had some experience after graduation um, seem to have a little bit of an easier time writing those essays. Um, but could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so um, so my, I have a class of 90, which is very abnormal for PA school. Most PA schools are 40 to 50. Um, I th- think Duke just like has, they, they just like know what they're doing with the PA like profession. And they just have like literally everything down to a science. It's kind of crazy. There's a lot of new PA schools out there and they're really only able to have like 40 students. And the reason why a lot of them are capped is because a lot of schools will say, we're not going to have more students than we can fill like quality clinical rotations. So they're not going to just fill seats to put people in clinical rotations that aren't going to be like high quality, um, which is good. And when you're looking at schools, you should definitely like ask about that because if they're new and they're just filling people into clinical rotations, like wherever they can find them, that's not necessarily as high quality as like these tr- tried and true kind of rotation sites that are really, really great. So um, 90 is a lot. <laughs> um, also, I'm surprised to hear yours is also that big because I, I do know that like a lot of these um, mid-level provider programs do keep their classes small. But I really like having 90 um, because there's so many pe- like diverse people in my class and I learn more from them than I do like from the actual clin- like the um, curriculum itself. Um, I have like uh, students in my class who've been medics or like paramedics for like 10 years and that's crazy experience. They can like literally read any EKG you give to them, which is crazy. Um, and I have some people in my class that are in their like late 30s or 40 and have three kids, which is incredible that they're doing PA school with that. Um, I have a couple of young people in my class that took one year out of school. And I will say that that is, they, they are few and far between for many PA schools like across the country. Um, I think that those two students in my class who did that were both CNAs for multiple years throughout college. So they did like full-time college and kind of like full-time or part-time CNA. Um, And that's how they were able to get their hours. Um, PA school, they, you need like at least a minimum. I think most programs are a thousand hours of hands-on patient care. So like even for my research job where I was doing hands-on patient care, there were some hours where I was behind a computer and I was not allowed to count those for my clinical hours. So you really do have to be like touching patients, talking to patients, um, working with patients for it to count. And it helps so much. That is the most important part of the application by far if you have really high quality patient um, hours. So I'd highly, highly recommend that. And just um, one clarifying thing is that the GRE is definitely mandatory for the PA application. So, and I don't think they're thinking about doing away with that. So just to think about. Karen, did you ask for anything else? (laughs) No, I think, oh, and no, the only other thing was, um, did you think in the application process, having had the clinical experience you did helped you to write the um, essays that are required for both PA and nursing school. So if you could touch on that, and then maybe we could just flip back to Alyssa to touch on the sort of the application process, the essay process. Go ahead. Yeah, I think some of the strong um, essays that I've read and something that I incorporated into my own essay is just like patient examples. If you can show how like I'm going to be a good PA because, and this is how I like learned this from patients and how I demonstrated this with patients and showing like actual autonomy and um, clinical practice. Like I, I wrote my essay and sent it to the doctor that I worked for. And I told, I, I kind of worded it like, you know, I, I take an important role by scribing like the important medical details into the chart. And she was like, Sarah, that is not what you do. You like come up with the medical di- um, like differential diagnosis with me. You like are my first assist in my surgeries. You Um, you know, you help me determine what the diagnosis is. You help explain the treatment to the patients. And like, I just didn't even put any of that into my essay. And she was like, you need to put what you do with patients in your essay. And I think having like really high quality patient experience 
um, just shows that you're ready for like more autonomy, which is what a mid-level provider is. It's like, you know, I was a medical assistant and the next step is having my own patients and having my own autonomy and like just showing that you're able to do that through patient examples um, is just puts you like head and shoulders over your peers, I would think. What about you, Alyssa? Um, let's see. Uh, so the first question was um, would, about the, the students in the program, is that right? It was, you know, more like the admission process and having had the experience that you had as a case manager and anything else, how did that help you, you know, to compose your essays um, for, for when you applied to nursing school? Got it. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So for UCSF and I think a few of the other schools that I applied to, I applied to seven ultimately. Um, which I did not need to do. I was just really nervous. I could have applied to three, and, but it's fine. Applied to seven. Um, a lot of them ask for like a goal statement and uh, a personal history statement. Um, so the goal statement is where you write about, I've had this experience, um, like this direct patient care experience. I've had, I have these skills and like this is what it, I want to do with those skills after like using the training that I can get from your school. Um, and I think that format was that format was recommended to me and I think it worked out well for me because I um, got good feedback on my essays, but also because um, yeah, it's just, it shows that you have something to offer them um, and that you you know, I think that at UCSF in particular, but a lot of the NP schools, it's all about um, making like social and system change. So like the system, the medical system as we know it, or the healthcare system as we know it is very broken and how can we fix it and how are we gonna be part of the change to make it better? So writing about that in your essay and about how like the, the thing that you wanna change that you're passionate about, for me, it was about, um, working with people who are making um, gynecological care and birth like consensual because there's so often this care that we provide where we don't tell people what we're doing we're not asking permission we're just doing um so i wrote about trauma-informed care and how i want to bring that um to my practice and i want that i want to make sure that that's um something that everybody around me is is practicing with um, and wrote about my experience working with um, domestic violence survivors um, and providing all these social resources and kind of how the last step was getting these like clinical skills because I could hear like even doing the social resources I wasn't able to still do that like um, like that body consent work that I wanted to do as a as a midwife um, yeah and so writing about, I think that's true for everybody in my program, um, writing about like your vision for healthcare and the personal statement is from your family experience or your, you know, some sort of personal experience and like how that informs the type of healthcare that you want to provide. And then the goal statement is kind of like professional experience and how that informs the healthcare you want to provide. Um, and, yeah, and recommendations are huge. UCSF has four to five, so I did I did five. And I did, um, it's ideal if you can get a mix of professors and someone you'd had your patient or like clinical experience with and somebody who's in the field. Um, so I had like a nurse, a woman's health nurse practitioner and I had a, um, an OBGYN write one too. So getting like a variety of references. Um, I think is helpful as well. Great, that's awesome. Thank you guys. Um, so I, I know, and I think the students probably know that um, grad school is really hard. Medical school is really hard. Grad school is really hard. Both of your programs, nurse practitioner and um, physician assistant programs are hard. Um, so one quick question, 
maybe you could talk a little bit about that, but um, did Bates, did you feel like Bates uh, prepared you pretty well? Or hopefully you did. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely think it did. Um, just in terms of like the critical thinking and all my tests right now are multiple choice, which is very different than Bates. <laughs> and I'm not, not very comfortable with multiple choice when I first came in, just because Bates like has you writing and writing, writing. Um, and that's really helpful for being a clinician for sure. But that multiple choice was a big adjustment for me. Um, like critical thinking and like patient communication when I do like my um, as patients and like talk with patients and everything, I just feel like um, the liberal arts, like education just really helped me with like connecting with people and communicating with people. And um, um, I don't know, just being knowledgeable about like a wide variety, like all the different classes that I was able to take at Bates, like medical ethics and things like that just all are really a foundational, I think, to like who I'm becoming as a PA. Um, I, I will say like a lot of people, a lot of my friends who are in medical school are like, I could never do PA school because of how condensed it is. And I think that they're like, I, like as a PA student, I would say I could never do medical school because of how long it is. So I think just kind of two different like sides to um, challenging and like difficult and how hard you have to work. Um, but it's, it's like a different, and like we were talking about this, Alyssa and I were talking about this, it's like a different kind of difficult. Like people are like, oh, PA school is so hard. In the back of my head, I'm like, oh, Bates got me ready, no problem. But it is a different type of like studying and a different type of learning. You really have to like master a wide variety or like wide range of information. And you really have to, it's just more information all at once than I've ever do they say it's like drinking out of a fire hose it just you just don't think that there's room in your brain for this amount of facts whereas my classes at Bates were just so nice and you could kind of go and do you know are your papers due in four weeks and go ahead and just take your time and research and think about it and like that's just not you have an exam every week and your exam is on all of hematology or all of cardiology and it's just it's more than I thought um, in terms of like learning but it's crazy, like looking back, it's hard at the time, but looking back, I'm like, I can't even believe I learned like all of that stuff in one year. And it's all very doable. And like, you just have to kind of trust the system, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, it seems like you're never gonna be able to learn all of this stuff. And um, you just stay like on the course and like listen to your, um, your lectures and like listen, just to redo all of your readings. It's like, it's crazy how much you're able to learn. Like it, the system really does work. Great. What about you, Alyssa? Um, I think for us, <clears throat> for me, the clinical piece has been, um, it's part of what I, it was a huge part of what I wanted, like at Bates. I was like, I'm pre-med. And then I felt so disconnected from being pre-med because I was not like with patients. I was in the classroom all the time and I was thinking, you know, organic chemistry. And I was like, what's this have to do with medicine? And um, it felt like really separate from what I wanted to do in my career. So one thing that is really, that I really liked is that you're doing clinical from the beginning. So I started last June, like the last week of June and the first week of July, I was in clinical two days a week. Um, and it was, so I had uh, over the summer, it was three days of class, Monday through Wednesday, and then I think one of those Tuesdays was our lab day and then Thursdays and Fridays were clinical days and you get there at what like 6 30 in the morning and you're there until in the summer we were there only until like five o'clock um so it's just like a different type of exhausted because it's like you're you're actually on the floor learning um from patients from you know, like, this is how you take vital signs, and this is how you do a patient assessment, and this is how you listen to heart and lungs, and um, you do all these things, like, from the very, very first week, um, but that's really motivating for your studies, because, like, we were learning about, um, in class, um, pressure ulcers, so it's, like, when you're lying down for a really long time that you can get sores, and learning about that in class and then like seeing it in clinical the same week was really important for me. Like it really solidified, wow, like that's what we just learned about. That's what I'm seeing. Um, that's what, this is why it happens. This is what I can do to prevent it. 
and like learning. So we learned about that within the context of um, like learning about skin. Um, and so within each system, you're learning about disorders or diseases that you're going to see like in clinical um, and then able to apply, you know, both and um, the applied knowledge from both. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's just kind of, I, it's been okay. Like I didn't, it's been more okay than I thought it would be. And it's a different type of difficult for me because it doesn't ask, they're not asking, um, you know, we taught you this thing, now apply it to something we haven't talked about before, the way that Bates does, where you, um, this is a little more like, we taught you this thing, like now apply it. Um, so you don't have to do that same like extra step of thinking, but in the master's portion, that's where I'll definitely be doing that more. But in the first year, it's really just like super time intensive. We also, we have our exams on Sundays. So I'm really, and then I'm studying on Saturdays. So it's really like six to seven days a week for the first year. Um, but yeah, it's okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it sounds pretty hard, but it sounds like it's fulfilling. Um, okay, so I don't, I wanna leave a little bit of time for questions, um, but my last question was more about how is, you know, we know what student life is like at Bates, and I know, you know, that you guys are in very different parts of the country now. How's student life, um, how's that working for you? Sorry, Alyssa, you... why don't you go first? Yeah. Um, I think, well, it's, di it's different in that, um, I think that like medical school from my friends who are in medical school is really like a continuation of Bates. It's like you have formals and you have like friend groups and people hang out with each other all the time. And some people are in relationships, but not like that many, like it's really like young, like it's like you, it's kind of just continuation. Whereas for me, this is like definitely more of like a grad school experience, which is, um, we had a formal, but I don't know how many people went to it. Like it's definitely all the like younger people that would go. Um, and we, so we spend time with each other outside of the classroom, but everybody, especially because UCSF prioritizes people who are in state, um, a lot of people have families or uh, relationships or something else going on already. So, um, and I was really nervous about that going in because I was moving across the country and I don't have any connections here. Um, and then I ended up actually meeting my partner when I was vacation, like when I was traveling before school and now we, we've been together like through the whole program. Um, and it's actually been very doable. I think it's, it's, I have friends who don't have relationships or families in the areas and in the area and they're, and they spend time with each other. And then if you do have family in the area or like a, a relationship, with somebody you're living with, then um, there's other people who are also with your partners and you kind of spend time with them. So there's like a big mix of people. Um, yeah, and I really love everybody in the program because everyone is really passionate about um, the same things. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of petitioning that happens. <laughs> There's a lot of like uh, asking the program for like better or for more or for, you know, we were expecting this and we're not getting it. And that's really cool to see people advocating for what they need and people are just really passionate. And um, I have no doubt that everyone I'm learning with are going to make incredible providers. And that's a really cool thing to say. That's great. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, I definitely agree with, life at Duke. I agree with a lot of that. I think um, for me, I got like really used to, I was well, like living and working in Boston for four years and I got really used to, you know, coming home from work and being done and being able to like see friends and kind of have like hobbies. Um, <laughs> and when I moved down, it was hard for me to move down to North Carolina just because there are a lot of really great day schools in Boston that I was like choosing between and it was just really hard not to go to Duke and like to say no to Duke because it was just like they started the PA profession. I decided that it was worth it to kind of like uproot my life and go down there. 
Um, but I've really like enjoyed being a student again and being um, like Alyssa said, it really is like grad school. It doesn't feel like I'm back in like undergrad. It doesn't feel like I'm, you know, a student again. It just feels like I'm finally like working towards my career in like a really meaningful way um, versus kind of like the kind of limbo of like being a medical assistant and not knowing like can't really see the end prize yet. But like, I just feel like this is like a, a huge investment in like my future career and it just like makes a lot of sense. I'm really happy with that. And I've been enjoying a lot of like what Duke has to offer. I think that's one of the benefits of going to like kind of a big community system, like the entire city of Durham is completely devoted to the school. Um, I think it like employs 75% of the city of Durham, which is really crazy. Like everyone has um, like the whole city shuts down when there's a basketball game and a few of my classmates and I actually camped out for a weekend for basketball tickets and so that was fun um, but I will say that a lot of like the social um, aspects of my life are kind of more medical now like we do um, like 5k's for Alzheimer's awareness or um, we you know do we're, we're doing the St. Baldrick's event where we're raising money for pediatric cancer research and we're like doing sh a shave-a-thon for it. And it's just like, I, I would, I will say that a lot of my like free time and like hobbies are kind of devoted to medicine, which is not really what I was expecting, but it's really just because like Duke has so much to offer and there's so many like events and speakers and everything that I don't really do as much as like my sort of hobbies that I did in Boston. I kind of am taking on like this is such a condensed time and I'm really spending a lot of time like with my classmates. We have the sh common shared interest and we're just like really enjoying, I guess, being a part of like the Duke community and just like taking it in because it really does go by really fast. So a different kind of social life, but it's really fun and being in grad school is really fun. That's great. Um, great. Thank you guys so much. Now, just if you students who are on the call, please reach out, uh, maybe via chat. And if you send a couple questions in, I'd be happy to um, ask Sarah and um, Alyssa to answer those. So does anybody have any questions? Come on, Basies, I know how you are. Can we just ask the question or do you want Yeah, to go ahead. That's great. All right. um, so I'm interested, I'm Gianna. I'm interested in going into nurse practitioning as well. And right now I'm having difficulty deciding which path I want to pursue. So I have a bit of clinical experience working as an EMT in Boston. Um, so I, I know I want to get into the clinical experience part of it, but I don't know if going down like a DNP route or getting a master's, like what the best option is for me. So maybe Alyssa, if you could maybe talk about how you decided to go into just into getting a master's in nurse practitioning versus like a doctorate in nurse practitioning? So the DMP is a newer thing. Like Columbia just changed their bachelor's to a master's and the master's to a DMP. Um, I think, sorry. <clears throat> For me, the DMP is really like, uh, I've thought about doing it down the line, but it doesn't seem necessary right now because it's not, it doesn't change who you are like as a practitioner, like it doesn't change the practice that you're doing. Um, and it doesn't change how much you're paid even. It really is, I would do a DNP like for my own knowledge of like doing research. Um, it's kind of like, if I wanna be, yeah, I would see it more related to to research than anything else. I think that it definitely doesn't make any difference clinically. Um, and if anything, a lot of schools are resistant to it because it makes it, um, it makes it more like inaccessible for people. So like a master's is a way to get more primary care providers out into practice sooner. Whereas when you add on more school and more money, it makes it like even harder for people to, to do that. Um, so I think that it's, um, I know that some programs are, are doing, one of my other programs, I think OHSU maybe, Oregon Health Sciences University, um, they might be doing the DNP now too. So if like the school converts to a DNP, then that's that. Um, but I don't think that I would, 
necessarily go out of my way for it unless like maybe later down the line I will but right now um right now I don't think it's that big of a difference yeah I don't know if that answered your question or not no that's good thank you anybody else have questions I have a quick question for Sarah mm -hmm. I'm also interested in applying for PA schools um but I was wondering as you started off um, being a medical assistant, did you find that, I know that some employers don't require a certification in medical assisting, but did you find that you learned a lot of skills doing that? And did you like pursue a certification before you started medical assisting? Um, no, and so a lot of private, I'm not, I actually have not run into any um, employers that do require it. And I know like for sure some do, but, um, I never like considered that and didn't really look into it. There was one uh, medical assistant at my work who was a certified medical assistant. Um, and I think that was just because it was part of her undergrad degree. Um, but my work had a lot of private practices will not require it. Like everyone in my, um, in my work at all the MAs, they were in the exact same place as me. They were pre-medical uh, school, pre-PA, pre-MP. Um, and they didn't have any certification and um, the offices really do like that. They like how like motivated we are and we're there like we kind of each need each other like they need us because we're like smart and able to like deal with patients and really motivated and trying to go into like into this field um, and like we need them for a clinical experience. So I think it's like a good fit. Um, and my work had this cool option where once you got there, you could do like a certified um, I was a certified derm tech, so it wasn't a certified medical assistant. It wouldn't like apply to any other field, but I basically sat down for like a week and instead of working, I was taking online like this online program and came out with like a certified derm tech. And the only benefit to that was that I knew more about like medical dermatology, I think more than what I needed to be a medical assistant, which was helpful for like my career as a PA because I knew more about dermatology, but definitely not necessary. I, I wouldn't get caught up in that unless like job requires it and if they require it they should probably like be able to steer you to where you can get certain thank you a lot Great, thank you yeah. other questions um, i i have a question um i'm callie yep. i'm interested in uh pa school so sarah i was wondering um like i know duke started the pa profession um and um it's obviously a really good school I was wondering like how what schools you apply to how you decide to go to Duke I feel like I've heard mixed ideas of if there is kind of like a hierarchy of PA schools in terms of like what are the things you should look for to know that a PA school could be better than others I don't know just how you decided to go there yeah so one tip for anyone that's applying like either this cycle or soon next cycle um when you're applying you I would apply like rank your schools and how like what you like about their program, their convenience for you, um, you know, their quality of their clinical sites, whatever it is that's important to you, and then apply to them in order because a lot of them you'll hear back from like rolling. And so for me, I agree with Alyssa, I applied to way too many schools and I ended up getting interviews at like all these schools and I'm like, if I even apply, I cannot go to all these interviews. So uh, if you kind of like stack them in a way that's like, Tufts is my first choice, Duke is my second choice, Emory is my third choice, whatever it is, um, like that, you'll hear back, you'll be able to be a little more selective and not like have all these schools like kind of like reaching back to you all at once, which is a good problem to have. Um, so that's one tip I would say, kind of stagger your applications a little bit. Um, number two is you really want to look at their accreditation status. Um, some of these new programs, um, like for example, there's a program that is a culinary school and they just came out with a PA school. And so I'm sure, I'm sure they're sending like, they're, you know, teaching people how to be great PAs, but I would just look into like what, um, what their backgrounds like, what their success rate, look at their pants pass um, scores, like rates, make sure that people who are graduating from that school are passing the pants like the first time. Um, and so a couple schools are losing their accreditation status for like little paperwork reasons. Um, for example, I was applying to University of Bridgeport and they were just in the process of fixing their accreditation status and the director like promised us it was literally a missed deadline that like has been fixed and unfortunately we just have to wait a year to get like everything back in a row but 
every person graduating from that program is going to have like a degree. Everyone coming in is going to have like the great uh, education that they promise. And I would just look at like accreditation status if they're not fully accredited, why? Um, and then also just quality of the rotation sites. Um, I know I was looking at a few schools in New England and I loved the programs. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And when I talked to students there, they were like, just not so confident in our rotation sites. And that was like, a problem um, for me. I just wanted to make sure that like, it was a no brainer. Like we haven't gotten our rotation um, schedule yet. And I just know that like, whatever they give me is gonna be fine because I just trust that like, they know what they're doing with rotation sites. And that's really key. Um, I think. Some of the programs are three years versus two. They're a little less condensed, um, but you, you have to pay for three years and you have to be there for three years. So I know some people who go to like um, MCPHS in Boston is three years. Um, and I think it's just less condensed, which has its pros and cons. Um, I chose Duke because it's like a primary care focus. Um, and I thought that would be really helpful. One thing that's great about PA school is that I can work in primary care for three years and then be a cardiothoracic like PA after that. And I don't have to do any like training again. I literally just have to do like on the site, on job training, like just to make sure I know it. But um, there's tons of flexibility. And so, um, yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, you did. Thank you very much. I applied like I applied to tons of schools and looking back, I'm like, why did I do that? I think that <laughs> dates and like my clinical experience, like I should have just trusted it and like gone like gone with my gut and like applied. That's why I keep telling people just apply to a few schools and like wait and see, get interviews back. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of resources. CASPA has like a lot of information about each school. Um, you can go online and see just, I would just say, look at their accreditation status, look at their pants pass rate, um, listen to what the students there have to say. But you can't, yeah, like you said, you really can't go wrong. Like a P, like as soon as you get a seat in PA school, you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Um, I'm Hannah. Um, I have a question for Sarah. I'm also interested in PA. Can I ask you how you swung from um, med school to PA school? Like what were some of the deciding factors for you? Yeah, um, I, I was like, the, I guess kind of like what Alyssa was saying with like when I was at Bates, it just didn't seem like there were any other options. Like I knew I was like a good student. You know, motivated. I liked medicine. And so I'm going to go to med school. Um, and just because like the PA and NP fields are like really up and coming and just like growing exponentially that I think it's like, it's going to take a couple of years for a few years for people to kind of like, um, follow those trends. Um, and so I think I was just like a little on the cusp of that trend. So I just was not exposed to it. Now I'm talking to like eighth graders who are like, I want to be a PA, which I think is crazy. I didn't even know what a PA was when I was in eighth grade. It's like really, really cool. But um, I would say that I, once I got out in like the work, working um, field, I was working for a doctor who did not see patients. He was like a clinical researcher and he didn't see any patients. And I was asking him for advice and he was like, well, you could be a hospitalist. Like I was telling him I was worried about the work-life balance. He's like, you could be a hospitalist and work two days a week and, um, you know, have a family. And in the back of my head, I'm like, why am I going to go to med school and work two days a week? Like, that is just a lot. And that's, I'm sure people do it. But that, to me, I just like want, that wasn't like answering my question about like the work-life balance. And so I went in and saw a PA like working. And I just like, it's literally the exact same thing. They see their own patients. This woman has been a PA for like 10 years. She, her and the doctor are completely peers. They talk about their patients with each other and like support each other's medical decisions and both have like full autonomy. Um, I really liked PA. Um, my cousin's a PA and he's been a PA for about five years. So I was able to like kind of have that resource as well. He just said that like when he goes home at the end of the day, he is able to turn his work life off, which is really important to him. Um, and I would just say kind of like the mental balance too, like just the, it's a little bit less like responsibility at the end of the day. It's still like a ton of responsibility. You still have like patients that are 
relying on you and your medical expertise, but um, you're not necessarily on call in a lot of specialties. I really liked the availability of being able to switch specialties um, throughout my career just to like keep things interesting, I guess. Um, and really liked the team-based care. And like Alyssa said too, I just found that when I worked with like alongside PAs and saw them practicing and talked to people who were pre-PA, I kind of was like, these are my people. Like this is, this kind of makes sense. These, these people remind me of myself and I think I would fit in like in this program. And it's really like quick and you're out there like in one year, I can't even believe it feels like I just started. In one year, I'm going to be a PA. <laughs> a huge benefit. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, great. Um, maybe one more question. If there's somebody that has a question, I just want to be respectful of their the alums time because I know they have very, very, very busy schedules with their um, academics. They're not quite over yet. Anybody else have an additional question? Otherwise, we'll say goodbye and say thank you. No. Okay, Sarah just sent out her um, email, and I imagine Alyssa will too. Um, Are any of, any of you guys applying right now? Is anyone applying? Is anyone applying right now? I'm applying to like NP program type things, but not PA school. Yeah. Let me know if it. Jenna, are you a senior, or are you a rising senior, or are you gra do you graduate? I'm almost not a senior anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah. So you'll be applying for admission for next year, right? Mm -hmm. For the year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And feel free to reach out. I realize we I didn't really talk about like. It's really different in nurse practitioner that you do specialize. So choosing like midwifery, family medicine, adult pediatrics, you know. So if anyone has questions about that, um, feel free to email me. Alyssa, why did you choose the midwifery track? I think that's awesome. All right, just give me one second. Um, I chose, so I, I knew I wanted to do OBGYN. Um, and then I um, love working with women and pregnant people. Um, and midwifery is kind of like, I think leading the way in healthcare in a lot of ways because of the um, type of practice that we provide. So for example, here in San Francisco, there's a lot of group prenatal care, which is where you um everybody gets their prenatal care together it's like and it's a way to um form community and relationships and get you know decrease isolation um and that model has been shown to work really well for not just like maintaining health and preventing disease but um i mean it, like it creates community for people, which a lot of people are, are lacking. Like when you leave Bates, like, and you, I don't know, they're like when you don't have like a school, um, it can be easily, easy to get isolated. Um, and so that's a really cool model for all sorts of care. And midwifery has a lot of like kind of uh, these like beginning ideas that then, you know, we trying to move like doula care like having someone advocating for you um, in birth, um, like in providing emotional support, like that that sort of thing should really be part of all healthcare as like having an emotional mm -hmm. support person and having like a, yeah, having community. So I really like those, those pieces of midwifery. That's great, that's great. All right, well, I don't wanna take up any more of your time Sarah and Alyssa, thank you so much. And thanks to you, all of you students who have joined us today. What a really good, uh, what a really good group. So I appreciate it. All righty, uh, everybody take care. And you've got Sarah's and Alyssa's email addresses. And of course, you have mine. All right, have a great day. Take care. Bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Karen. Yo, you're welcome.